So I'm going to talk about a peer like maximum likelihood impact imaging and judge for imaging detection. And here's the outline I'm going to talk about. First, I will introduce the PET, and I will talk about the PML control plan, and then the task-based image quality to evaluate the detection performance. Then I will talk about the major contribution of this work is to optimize the PML reconstruction uh, for detection by designing a penalty and including the resolution model. And finally, I will show its extension to the dynamic PET. So PET is one of the vertical imaging modality that use radio tracer to imaging the function of the living body. So you will first inject the radio tracer into the patient, and this radio tracer will emit a body chart, which is going to analyze with an electron. And this process is going to produce two back-to-back -back photons. And these two photons will be detected by the PET scanner. And after we measure a number of these photons, uh, reconstruction laser can be used to recount a map which reflect the tracer distribution in the human body. And this reconstruction will be presented to the medical doctors to perform the clinical application. And one of the major uh, clinical application of the PET is in oncology. It's increasingly being used for, for, for staging and treatment monitoring. But however, due to the low signal to noise ratio, it's still very hard to detect a small tumor with the size less than 10 millimeters. And numerous efforts have been focused on this to improving the detection of small tumors by developing the new PET tracer or the new PET scanner, like a top system or a dedicated PET system. And here we focus on optimizing the image reconstruction methods for this purpose. So in PET, we can use a vector Y to represent the data we measure, and the reconstruction method is to produce a image X, which is also a vector. And when this the Y do not contain the noise, we can model it as the mean Y bar equal to the PX plus R, where P is the system matrix and R is the mean of the random and scatter. And in the photon counting process of the PET, uh, it's not that the data Y will follow the Poisson distribution with the mean equal to the Y bar, so we can write out this Poisson distribution with given the Y bar. And then putting this PX plus R into this Y bar, we can have the log likelihood function as showing this here, which is the log likelihood with the given y with respect to the x. Then have this log likelihood function, and one very popular reconstruction method is called the maximum likelihood reconstruction. It's to find for each sonogram y, we find the x which maximizing this likelihood function. But it's been shown that the ML reconstruction has a job by when it is converged, if the solution is very noisy. So people propose to use this PML reconstruction, which we combine the likelihood function with the penalty function phi x to penalize the difference between the neighboring pixels. And the beta is the parameter that balances the low likelihood function and the penalty functions. And one popular penalty function is the cojective penalty function that has been widely used in PET. So the cojective penalty function can be run into a pairwise, can be run into a sum of the pairwise potential. So for each pixel j, it will penalize uh, this. It will penalize the difference between this pixel and each of its neighboring pixels inside the neighborhood n j. So for example, for the first order neighborhood n j only can see, only contain four neighboring pixels, and this uh, weight, the the weight here is for each pairwise equal to one for the first order quadratic penalty. And the quadratic penalty function can be written into a matrix form as shown here: x transpose times r times x. And the R is we refer it to a penalty matrix. So one challenge, so there are usually two challenges in the PML reconstruction. The first one is how do you select this penalty parameter, the beta or the gamma here. The second one is the system modeling P matrix as including in the likelihood function. So let's focus on the first challenge. So here we will first show an effect of the beta on the real patient reconstruction on the specified PET CT scanner. So as we can see, from beta too small to become a large, when it's small, the PML reconstruction will approach the ML solution and it's very low easy. And when the beta becomes large, the image will become over smoothing and then we, we may lose the fine details. So how to choose this beta is actually a challenge task and people have a uh, proper measure to optimize the projective penalty parameters for different tasks for achieving uniform resolution or optimize the local contrast to noise ratio. 
and also have been used to improve the vision detectability in 2D. So the first focus of my work to, is to extend this method to fully 3D. To extend this method to fully 3D, we first need a figure of memory to measure the vision detectability in 3D. So how are we going to do that? And the gold standard to measure the vision detectability is using the human ROC studies. So let's say here we want to compare the Mesa A with the Mesa B. We first need to acquire a lot a set of the sample it either contains a tumor or not, and then we will recount this data using Mesa A, and then presenting the human observer with the reconstruction. The human observer is going to read each reconstruction with a scalar, which the higher value means the higher possibility that this reconstruction will contain a tumor. And then we can plot this ROC curve by comparing the true positive ray versus the false positive ray, as shown here. And then for reconstruction B, we need to repeat all the process again, and then we can plot another ROC curve for this Mesa B. And then from this two ROC curve, we can compute the AUC for this two curve. And then right now we can say that the Mesa B has a higher performance than the Mesa A. But as you can see, using human observer is very time consuming. So people have been proposed using this computer observer based on the signal processing. And one important reason using the computer observer is not just to reduce the cost, it's to provide the possibility for theoretical analysis, which is very important for my work. So for each reconstructed image X, the computer observer is going to compute a test statistic and then compare it with a threshold to determine whether this image has a tumor or not. And then by changing this threshold, we can plot the RC curve as shown here. And the signal to noise ratio of this test statistic can be used as the figure of memory uh, for measuring the detection performance. It actually measures the separation between these two hypotheses by calculating the mean difference of the test statistic and the two uh, conditions divided by its mean variance. And when this test statistic is no more distributed, the AUC can be related to SNR by this formula. We can see if a uh, Mesa has a higher SNR, which means it has a higher performance. So right now, deep learning numerical observer has been proposed, and one very popular choice is called a channelized Hawking observer. It has been shown to have good correlation with the human performance. <coughs> and here we show the flowchart of this 2D chart. You were given a 2D image reconstruction. You will first apply a channel function, which mimics the human visual system to it, and then compute the channel output. And here we need to add an internal noise n with zero mean and covariance can to it because there is uncertainty in the human detection process. And then we are going to apply a Hotelian observer on this ux plus n to get a final test statistic as showing this formula here. Where z is the mean reconstructed region profile and k is the covariance of the channel output. So this is for the 2D test. Right now we have a 3D image, how are we going to do that? The first model people have been using is called a single slice chart. Where you are going to apply this 2D channel on one slice of this 3D which contains the tumor, and then you follow all the process, and in mathematically, this test data will be the same as the 2D chart, but now this U is a 3D channel, but has the 2D channel applied on one slice. The second model people have used is called a multi-slice chart because that for a large tumor, it may not just in one slice, it may have in the labeling slice. So you are going to apply this channel on different slides and then combine the channel output into the same process to calculate this test statistic. And in, in this work, the model we are going to use is called a multi-view chart because we want to mimic the condition where the human observer open exam three orthogonal view to detecting a lesion. So we are going to apply the channel on each three view and then compute the channel output and then get a test statistic. Also, there's a fourth model called a multi-view multi-slice chart. You can apply this channel on different slides and different view. But since here we only focus on small region detection and we think that the neighboring slides may do not contain so much information. So we will use this multi-view chart as the figure of memory. From the test statistic, we can derive the signal to noise ratio as computed by this formula. To compute the SNR for a reconstruction method, we need a Z and a K, which is depends on the mean and covariance of the reconstruction. So for region at given locations, we derive a theoretical expression to compute the UZ and K using pattern series and locally shift invariant approximation. And here we give the final formula to compute the UZ and K in Fourier space. 
And looking at these two formula, we can find that the UZN in K will depends on the four components. The first one, it depends on the channels. The second one, it depends on the system response, which is the color vector of the facial information matrix we're showing here. And also, it will depend on the signal we want to detect, which is the mean median profile. And what we are interested in is, it depends on the penalty kernel, RUJ, which is the penalty kernel used at a pixel J. And putting the UZ in K into the SNR formula, we can derive this SNR as a function of the beta times this uh, Fourier transform of the penalty kernel. For the first order quadratic penalty, you have a fixed R, and then you can plot the SNR as a function of the beta. Or in other way, we can fix the beta equal to 1, and then optimize this REJ to find the maximum SNR. So next, we are going to show how we're going to uh, do the penalty design to find the optimal penalty kernel to maximizing the SNR. So the penalty kernel REJ can be factorized into several basic symmetry kernels, DJ, L, and with the weighting gamma. So for example, in the 2D first order quadratic penalty, the kernel will do like this. It only has the weight on the four neighboring pixels. It can be factorized into two kernels, D1 and D2, corresponding to the vertical pixels and also the horizontal pixels. Then the, Fourier, then the Fourier transfer of this REJ will become the sum of the Fourier transfer of this basic kernel times the weighting. Then the penalty design is reduced to finding the optimal weight gamma, which maximizing the SNR. In, in our design, we use a large neighborhood which contains 92 nearest neighboring workshop, and we need to find 46 weight to optimize this SNR. Then performing this weight for all the pixels is very time consuming. So to reduce the computation time, uh, we only compute the optimal weight for a set of the pre-selected workshop on a post grade. And then we use the nearest neighbor interpolation to form the final penalty function. And here we show the procedure of this penalty design method. So the first, for a given sum of ground y, we will first approximate this one over the y by the one over y plus one to get rid of the zero counts in the y. And we will pre-compute the Fourier transform of the channel F E, and then pre-compute the Fourier transform of each pairwise penalty kernel B. And for each voxel J on the cross square, we will simulate a small region F L as a hot spot at the voxel J and compute its Fourier transform. And we'll form a project a just unit vector by the system matrix to compute a PUJ and then do another uh, and then perform a weighted back projection to get this back and then compute this Fourier transform. Then we can use MyClap function to estimate the optimal weight gamma, which maximizes the SNR. And then after we do this for loop, we can assign the weighting factor to other voxel, which is not in the cost grid using the nearest neighbor interpolation. So right now we have de described the penalty design method in the task-based PML reconstruction. We are going to first show the validation using computer-based simulation. So here is the simulation method. We simulated a GE DSP whole body scanner with the field of view axial equal to 157 mm and transaxial equal to 700 mm. The crystal size is about 6 by 6 by 30 mm. And we generated a digital phantom. Here we show one, one slice of this 3D phantom. We segment out three regions of this drug breast. And then we simulated five small regions with diameter of three millimeter and also a large region with diameter eight millimeter. And the contrast ratio is 2.2 to one. And the phantom width and without a tumor were formal projected. And then we add an independent possible noise to generate 200 noise realization, each with around 100 million total counts. <coughs> and the first result show here, we want to compare this four 3D show we plot before. So here we plot the performance of this four 3D chart as a function of the beta for a 3 mm region and an 8 mm region. So we can see that for a 3 mm region, the neighboring slice doesn't provide too much information because we can see this the single slice chart as this blue and the pink is the multi-slice chart has very similar performance. And the multi-view chart has very similar performance as multi-slice multi-view chart. And for a large region, the labeling slides do provide much information for detecting a region. So here we focus on a 3mm region, so we will use a multi-view chart. 
Next, we want to compare the detractability of the PML reconstruction using these two penalties. One is the conventional first order quadratic penalty, the other is the global penalty function. Here we show the results at two sample locations. So this, so this cyan solid line and the red dash line is the theoretical prediction of these two penalty as a function of the beta. And we also compute the Monte Carlo results at this time cross in a red circle from 200 noise realization. 200 noise realization. And we can see that the Monte Carlo result matches the theoretical result and both showing that the plot penalty can improve the lesion detection performance. So here is one sample reconstruction using these two penalty functions. There is a very small tumor in the blue, in, in the center of the blue circle. Here we show a zoom in. So it's just one half pixel. We can see the plus penalty do have a good seeing of this small lesion then compared to the first order quadratic penalty. So right now next, we are going to perform a human observer test because we want to see whether the numerical observer do reflect the performance of the human performance. So here, we perform this called a two alternative false choice experiment. So the first human observer was presenting a set of the 20 pairs of this for the training. So for each time, one pair of the reconstruction will show to the human observer. And the human observer will ask to pick the one which contains the tumor. And then after he picked, he will get a response whether he made a right choice or he made a wrong choice. And then after this training process, the human observer is going to have a test process which contain 180 pairs. And he still need to pick one of these two reconstruction which contain a tumor, but he will not know the results until he finished all this test process. And after he finished all the test process, we can compute this resulting percent correct, which is the number of the choice where the human observer made the right choice divided by the number of the total test pairs. And yes, can show that this resulting percent correct can be converted to the signal to noise ratio by this formula, which will allow us to compare the human observer SNR with the numerical observer SNR. So here we show the SNR of the human observer at two locations. So we have two human observers. We can see that the human observer SNR, as denoted by the sign cross in the red circle, match the theoretical result of the numerical observer. So in the next section, we are going to validate this measure using the real data. We will need to implement the penalty design on the uh, GEDSD scanners. So from GEDSD scanner, when it's the scanner patient, we will acquire the PET data and the CT data. And the CT reconstruction is going to be used to estimate the attenuation. From the PET data, we can extract the forms and the normalization and estimate the random and scatter. We will use this to design the penalty and put it into the PML reconstruction. And then we are going to evaluate this method using the real data. We need to ensure that we have the gold standard of the real data, which means we have the perfect knowledge of the presence and location of each region. To get this, we first obtain a region for a patient background from a 60 minute PET scan of a female patient with 5 minute period FDG injection. And the figure will cover the heart, breast, and part of the lung and liver. And we sum up the last 45 minute data to create a high concern of well with 800 million photo event. And to generate the legion present data, we scan the point source uh, in air as showing this cross grade at 27 locations. And the sonogram of the point source is going to first attenuate by the patient body and then add it to the patient sonogram. And we, ex and we exclude seven positions, which is outside of the patient bodies. Here shows a sample reconstruction of a super impulse lesion in the liver, as in the center of these circles. And then we add independent boson noise to generate 200 noise realization, which will allow 90 million total counts to mimicking a conventional 5 minute scan. And we compare these two reconstruction methods one is the PML with the first order project, and the other is the PML with the optimized plot with the optimized penalty. And this is the size of the reconstruction. And we estimate the random scatter and normalization from the patient data using a GE Pactual box. And both reconstruction methods using the same forward backward projector and all these crunching factors, which means that the only difference is in the penalty functions. And then we are going to compare this detection performance of these two uh, reconstruction methods at two locations. 
One is in the soft tissue, the other is in the liver. So again, we can see that the uh, multi color result matches the theoretical result, then both showed up probability can improve the detection performance. And here is the corresponding human observer results. That is two locations. So in general, it still fits to the theoretical prediction of the numerical observer. And here we show the human observer results at all 20 locations by these two methods. We can see that this probability can improve the uh, performance at all locations by up to 15%. So in the next section, we are going to talk about the resolution modeling. So let's take a detailed look ahead of the P matrix. Without considering the normalization and attenuation, the system matrix P can be factored into these three P matrix. The middle one is uh, the geometric projection matrix, and the other two P matrix is used for resolution modeling to model the effects such as positron range, photon non collinearity, and crystal penetration. And the resolution modeling has been more and more popular in power reconstruction to get a high resolution reconstruction. Here we show a simple example of the point source, what uh, the resolution modeling is needed. So if there's a point source, if we only have this geometric projection, we are going to get this perfect sinus shape. But in reality, but actually in practice, due to this effect, which actually degrades the resolution, this is the major sinogram we are going to get. So we can see if without these two measures, we will get a reconstruction with uh, lower resolution. So in practice, people usually model this system matrix either in sinogram space or in the image space. So in sinogram space, the P matrix can be equal to S multiplied by G, and S is the sinogram space plotting matrix, and G is the geometric projection matrix. And for this one, the PR is equal to the G in B. B is the image space plotting matrix. And in this work, we will we'll focus on the image space resolution modeling. The reason is because there's one advantage of the image space resolution modeling. It's suitable for the least small reconstruction and can be used for the top least small recon. So how do we get the least B matrix? So each column of this B matrix is actually the resolution kernel used at the pixel, at the corresponding pixel. And then we can estimate this kernel using the major point spread function. So you will have a point source scan, and then you will do this uh, point source reconstruction, and then fade into this B, EJ. But it has been pointed out that this major PSF may actually overestimate the true PSF, and more importantly, it may not be optimal for detection task, because that when you're including the B matrix, it do improve the resolution, but it also increase the pixel correlation, which may actually degrade the detection task. So next, we are going to extend our theoretical expression to evaluate the effect of the B matrix on detection task. And we still use the generalized Hotelian observer and its SNR as the figure of memory, and we still need the Z in K to compute the SNR. So here we give the final formula to compute the UZ and K. So it looks very similar to the previous one, but here we are going to separate out the DEJ from the facial information matrix. And BEJ is the resolution kernel used at a pixel J. And putting the UZ in K into SNR formula, we can evaluate the SNR as a function of the BEJ, and also it's going to be a function of the beta. And when we compare the BEJ, we will use a first order Kojabi penalty, and then find the optimal beta for each BEJ. So next section, we are going to first validate it using computer-based simulation. So we still simulated a GBAT scanner geometry. We have a 2D digital bundle as shown here, with 200 by 200 pixels with size 3.2 by 3.2 millimeter. And a small tumor was simulated at the center of the blue circle with contrast back to one. And we simulated three scanner PSF using a Gaussian function with different fully width half maximum sigma T from 4.8 millimeter to 9.6 millimeter to simulate a high resolution system and a low resolution system. And the resolution modeling used in the construction was a shift invariant Gaussian function with the fully width half maximum sigma r from 0 to 22 millimeters. And as we said before, the SNR is going to be a function of the sigma r in beta. 
And so for each sigma, we are going to find the optimal beta, which maximizing the SNR. And then we can plot this SNR as a function of the sigma r for three sigma t, as shown in this three figure here. So a summary that is uh, in this table, we can see that when the sigma t equals to 4.8 millimeter, it actually prefer no resolution modeling will achieve the best performance. When the sigma t equals to 9.6 millimeter, it actually prefer a large resolution kernel with 17.6 millimeter. And in this case, the optimal sigma r only coincide with the sigma t when it equals to 6.4 millimeter. In the next, we are going to perform the Monte Carlo simulation to demonstrate what we find in theoretical result. We first plot the SNR as a function of the beta using different sigma r for, uh, for sigma t equal to 4.8 millimeter and 9.6 millimeter. And then we compute the Monte Carlo SNR from 200 noise realizations. We can see the Monte Carlo result match the theoretical results. And when the sigma t equal to 4.8 millimeter, it shows that no resolution, it shows that actually you including the resolution modeling doesn't improve the performance. But when the sigma t equal to 9.6 millimeter, it shows that this 17.6 millimeter will achieve the highest performance. In the next session, we are going to validate this measure using the real data. So we are still using the same pension data with the superimposed artificial regions. And the resolution modeling used in the real data uh, is get by first reconstructed a point source reconstruction, and then we will use a mixture of two dosing functions to fit this reconstruction. And the fitted kernel is going to be scaled by a factor alpha from zero uh, to 1.5 and used as resolution modeling in recon. Here we show a sample kernel with different uh, factor from 0.8 as uh, refer to the partial resolution modeling and 1.2 as over resolution modeling. And then we can plot the SNR as a function of this R alpha here for these two locations. One is in the liver, the other is in the soft tissue. And for both cases, we will find that a partial resolution modeling with the alpha equal to 0.8 would result in the highest SNR. And next, we still perform the Monte Carlo simulation to demonstrate what we find. So here we first plot the Monte Carlo, uh, we first plot the theoretical SNR as a function of the beta for these two locations for load resolution modeling and the task based resolution modeling as this pink dash line. And we also combine the resolution modeling with the penalty design as shown in this red dash line here. And then we compute the Monte Carlo SNR from 200 noise realizations as given here. So it's there again the Monte Carlo result match the theoretical predictions and both show that the task-based uh, resolution modeling and with the penalty design can achieve the highest performance. So here is the follow-up human observer experiment at two locations by these three nurses. It generally follow what we find in theoretical result and Monte Carlo result. So the next we are going to show the last focus of this thesis is the extension to the dynamic patch. So why we want to go to the dynamic path? Because right now the conventional steady path usually performs the scanned uh, 60 minute pulse injection and it only follows the tracer compensation at a single time point, like here. And in comparison, the dynamic path will acquire the data over a period of, or, or over a period of time and then you can follow the tracer compensation as a function of time, you can get this TSC. And it's very reasonable to expect that this full TSC can contains more information for detecting for detecting allegiance. And to extract useful parameter from this TSA, we need to use the tracer penalty model to extract it. And in this work, we will begin a linear model called a pipeline, which states that after the tracer reaches the stable states, the tissue TSC CT can be represented by a weighted sum of the blood input function CPT and its integral. So for example, here we have a blood input function as a, from zero to 60 minutes, and we also have a tissue TSC CT. And then we can fit this into a line as showing here after the tracer, after 20 minutes, where the tracer reach a stable state. And this care here is actually the slope of this pipeline plot. It's a very useful parameter. It reflects the in rate of the tracer 
and can be used for region detection because the tumor usually has a higher payout value than the normal than the normal TEC. So from the dynamic test, we acquire the sonogram Y as a function of the time. So how can we reconstruct that the pair in B for each pixel from this dynamic sonogram Y? So there are usually two methods. The first one is called the indirect reconstruction methods. You will first perform a frame by frame reconstruction, and then you can extract the TSA for each pixel. And then you perform the pipeline modeling fitting to get this pair in B. Or in other ways, you can combine the pipeline model with the reconstruction to be to derive, estimate the KRB from this sonogram Y. Then for both methods, we need to optimize it for region detection. So let's first take a look at of the mathematical model here. So the dynamic image X, which contains a T frames from 1 to T, it can be related to the KRB by this formula here, where A is a matrix that is comprised of the blood input function in its integral, and the iron is an N by N identity matrix. And this is a chromatic product with the definition given here. And we need here is because we actually perform the pixel by pixel fitting. So you need to consider the KID is actually a vector. And similarly, we can write the, di the dynamic sign, the sonogram Y, with the mean Y bar equal to this formula, which is very similar to the first formula. Just replace the item to the system matrix P, and also plus the R, which is the mean of the random and scatter for each frame. And with, and with this y bar, we can draw out the low echo function for the dynamic sonogram y with respect to the x or with respect to the ki and b. It's very similar, given by these two formula. In performing the indirect reconstruction, we need two steps. First step, we are going to perform the frame by frame reconstruction. So for each frame n from one to t, we're going to perform a PML reconstruction with the beta x that's applied on the frame by frame reconstruction. And then we are going to apply this least square fitting. Then we will refer this method as the indirect one method. As we can see, when we perform this least square fitting, we do not consider the correlation of the pixel in the KR and B, and this may result in very noisy realization. So to solve this, we propose an indirect two reconstruction method. We are, when we apply this least square fitting, we are going to apply a quadratic penalty function on the KI and B with two beta to control the schedule. And in comparison, the derived reconstruction is going to estimate the KI and B from this log likelihood function with respect to the KI and B, and also with the quadratic penalty function on the KI and B. And all, for all these three methods, we will see that the penalty parameter beta, this five beta, is going to affect the reconstruction. So how are we going to uh, find this optimal beta to achieve uh, the best task performance. Then we will apply a trainerized hotelling observer on the KI and use its big, and use its SNR as a fake of memory. So right now this Z in the K will depend on the mean and covalence of the KI. So first for the indirect one reconstruction, doing the D square fitting, we can draw all this close form solution of the indirect one. We can see that the KI in B is actually linear respect to the dynamic image reconstruction frame by frame. So if we know the mean in covariance of the X, we can estimate the mean in covariance of the KI in B. So here we use the previous method to derive the mean in covariance of the X for different frames, and then put it into to estimate the mean in covariance of the KI in B for the indirect one method, and putting Z in covariance into SNR formula. We can estimate the SNR of the indirect one method as a function of the beta x. For the indirect two reconstruction, we are going to apply a quadratic penalty function on the k and b, which can be derived into this matrix form. And then we can have the cloud, we, we can have another cloud form solution for the indirect two reconstruction, as shown in this formula here. So we will use this B matrix to represent this guy here. We can see the KI in B is still linear with respect to the X. So we can estimate the mean in covariance of the KI by this formula here. And then putting this into the SNR formula, we can estimate the SNR of the indirect two reconstruction as three beta. One beta X is applied on the frame by frame reconstruction. And the beta KI and beta B is applied when you do the least square fitting with the projective penalty. 
And for the derived reconstruction, we need to consider this echo net product with a P as a simple system matrix. Then we can have the official information matrix computed by this formula here. And with the same code dependency function applied on the KI and B, we can have the we can have the final formula to estimate the mean in coverage of the KI for the derived reconstruction using this formula. Put it into the SNR, it's, we can estimate the SNR of the derived reconstruction of the beta KI and beta B. So right now we have the theoretical expression to evaluate this. Actually, this formula looks simple, but it's not simple to compute because it requires an inversion of a very large matrix. And we deal this by using the title series and locally shift invariant approximation to derive a simplified expression to fast evaluate the region stability and then you get to find a selection of beta for all these three methods. And we will compare these three methods with the conventional expected type reconstruction of the last frame. So this three patch actually is the major contribution of my work on dynamic patch, but I know you don't like the math. So we are going to uh, go to the simulation to see whether this theoretical formula will work or not. So we simulated a GE690 PET CT scanners. We generated a 2D digital phantom with three regions, with the breast tissue and the lung region and also the tumors. And we extract the TSC for the blood input function and also for these three regions from one real patient the construction, which has 60 minutes scan and contain 49 frames. Then we forward project this phantom to get a to get a dynamic sonogram with 24 million total pump. So we are going to first plot the SNR of the conventional reconstruction as a function of the beta x as shown in this line here. And then next we are going to plot the SNR as a function of the indirect one reconstruction as a function of the beta x as shown here. So for the interval 2 reconstruction, we know that the SNR is going to be a function of three beta. For each beta x, we can plot the SNR as a function of the beta ki and beta b. And then finding the maximum value for this beta x, and then we can plot the SNR of the interval 2 reconstruction as a function of the beta x, as shown in this pink line here. And for, and for the derived reconstruction, it's going to be a function of the beta ki and beta b as shown here. So for each beta b, we can plot the SNR of the beta ki by finding the optimum beta b to put it into the right curve here. So here, in this figure here, the beta for different methods may not uh, represent the same meaning. So when we're comparing different methods, we're only comparing the maximum of each method. Next, we perform the Monte Carlo simulation to demonstrate what we find in the theoretical result. We compute the Monte Carlo SNR from 200 noise realization. As we can see, this Monte Carlo result matches the theoretical result. And it demonstrates the benefit of the interactive reconstruction and derived reconstruction. So here shows a sample reconstruction of these four methods, each under its corresponding optimal penalty parameter. As we can see, this interval 2 reconstruction and derived reconstruction has the highest SNR along the region. Next, we are going to evaluate these four reconstruction methods under the different tumor TSC. We extract the breast tumor TSC from other three patients. And then we are going to plot the performance of these four methods at different tumor TSC. We observe a very similar uh, performance as the tumor TSC1. Both the interval 2 reconstruction and derived reconstruction can improve the detection performance. So there is one limitation of the dynamic patch because it requires a prolonged scan time. So people have been using been proposing using the dual time petalite reconstruction because when you uh, perform the petalite fitting, you are actually fitting a line and you only need two time points to fit a line. So here we are going and this protocol will allow us to perform the whole body petalite reconstruction. Here we use our theoretical formula to evaluate uh, the pattern fitting from seven frames and also from two frames. The two frame performance is shown in this dashed line here. We can see that uh, the two frames do decrease the performance when compared using all the seven frames, but it still increases the performance uh, by 15% compared to the conventional last frame reconstruction. And we conclude this session with a clinical example. 
we are going to implement in the integral two reconstruction on the G six nineteen scanner as before we showed that the integral two reconstruction has very comparable performance with the derived reconstruction. So we only implement the integral two reconstruction. To perform the integral two reconstruction, we need the TSC from the blood input function, then also from the tumor in background regions to design the optimal penalty parameters. So we first from the dynamic algorithm Y, we first perform a frame by frame reconstruction and then extract this TSA from this frame by frame recount and then put it into the integral two reconstruction to get a final KR and B. So here shows a sample reconstruction of these three methods, each at its optimal penalty parameters. So there is a very large tumor and a right breast. Then we also simulated a distant small region at by a point source. We can say that the integral two reconstruction under the optimal regularization parameter do improve the performance compared to the static and the integral one reconstruction. So in summary, we have to develop a method to evaluate and optimize the PML reconstruction for DG detection from static path to dynamic path. And we demonstrate the benefit of the task-based PML reconstruction uh, including the resolution modeling and penalty designs by using a computer-based Monte Carlo simulation and real data. And the extension to the dynamic path show further improvement for leaking detection. In future work, we will first to extend the shift invariant resolution modeling to shift variant and then apply it to a top list more data. We will also extend our dynamic path reconstruction to the nonlinear connected model, such as uh, the full compartment model. And besides the detection task, we will also extend it to localization task and quantification task. Then we are going to apply all of the methods to the next generation of the PET scanner, such as the Explorer. We will design the penalty for vision detection, also with this two meter field of view axial. We can perform this whole body dynamic path analysis. So here is a summary of my publication. Right now I have two public journals and also submitted a third one. I also have three conference papers and three conference extra, all with the first option. So, final slides. So I want to thank my PR Professor Chi for taking me as a hidden student and feed me into this medical image world, show me how to become a good research, and also encourage me to present in my work and conference. So I think without him, I don't think I can come so far to finally reach the end of my PhD. I also want to thank uh, Simon Wendy and RPG for serving as my co committee for providing many uh, comments and suggestions on this work and bringing this work to his colleagues today. I want to thank all the lab made books in Cherichi by the way lab. Uh, I learned a lot in these big labs, especially I want to thank Jian and Google about for, for helping me set up my research in the very be be beginning. I would also like to thank I'm going to who helped me to perform the human observer experiment and also get the point source measurement. And I also want to thank Lordly for reading the real patient reconstruction and also chart for his help on the G-Pectoral box. And thank you, thank you for attention. Question. So in your last dynamic, you compare the static with indirect one, indirect two, and uh, direct, right? Yes. So, but for the static, it is there is no ki there, right? Yes. So let's apply on the SEU your your way. So that's the channel that's rotating on the SEU your way, and the other is on the ki. But so you can compare the region detectability. So it, it is okay to compare. Yes. Okay. Uh, so your focus is on small lesion detection, and uh, when we say small lesion, we can say it's from like three millimeter to ten millimeter. So how could, uh, how would uh, your measures have different influence on 
if the uh, size. Yeah. I think because here a lot of vision is more easier to detect and you will focus on the quantification task rather than the detection task. So here we will still focus on a small region detection because the detection will on a small region will make a bigger impact. Uh, so, what do you think about the biggest challenge for moving your work into clinical implementation? I guess we, if we want to move the dynamic pad into the clinical, we need maybe we need a population based the TSC for the blood input function, and also population based TSC for the tumor and the background all events. That's why we need to solve and when we implement it on a clinical scanner. I'm interested in this may be a bit premature to even ask because it's more about the future uh, direction that you mentioned, but I'm just curious about moving from the detection to the localization yes. and um, how much of a shift in the framework would that require so, so right now, not so many work is on the localization task. It's because the numerical observer for the localization is not so pretty developed. So that's one challenge. Okay. Yeah, even in baseline Yes, that's right. Yeah. Does, uh, does the positron range have any effect on how easy it is to detect a lesion? Like, like for example, if you're using a radio tracer that has a pretty big positron range, like rubidium versus like fluorine, is there any effect there? I think if the trace of the different positron range, you can, let's say if you do can model this in the resolution modeling, you will get back to a very similar result. You can collect this effect. And when you compare different tracer, I think, I think you may want to first to say how much counts, how much contrast may have a bigger impact rather than just saying the positron range. Because I could imagine that something with a, a larger range would make the uh, a small lesion appear to be larger, but I don't know if that's that would be makes it more detectable. Or maybe I'm totally off. I don't know. I I still think it would depends on the contrast. Okay. Inside your simulation contract, why is 2.2 and the other is 5? Yeah, so yes, one is the 2.2, but that one is on the 3D and the other is on a 2D case, and they may not have a similar background count. So, the general way we want, we detect, uh, we choose a contrast because we want to have uh, SLR equal to 2. Point something, which would relate to the percent crack equal to 90% and then we can help us to perform the tumor observer experiment later because you don't want to have a very high SLR and then you will get a percent current equal to 100 and then there's no difference between the two methods. And uh, what, what's the, do you know what's the, and, uh, do you have a real tumor in your study? Yeah, so this one, the large one, this is very thick, it's, uh, but for now, we don't have a small tumor. Mm -hmm. We simulated a small tumor by point so. so what's the SLR of this one? I think this one is very big, like 10 or something. So in your final conclusion, you said that you want to implement the indirect tool into the clinical. So after 
director one has the same performance as the indirect two, why do you choose to use, use indirect two? Because the indirect two reconstruction, you first perform this frame by frame reconstruction, right? And the frame by frame reconstruction is current synthetic. <coughs> It's the current protocol to recon, right? Oh. And then you just need to another fitting on this frame by frame. You don't need to recompute the direct. It save for much of the computation times. So these two images seem that in that one to have the different place data. I already forgot what's the main difference for so the indirect one don't have a penalty on this KI, but this indirect two has a penalty. Oh, so it's more. Yeah. So this is a, this is similar like when you do the EM reconstruction and then you iterate it to a conversion. This is like a map reconstruction. Is there anything about the experimental design um, that you think you could change that would reveal a difference between the direct and the indirect? Sorry, I didn't get your question. You know, the, the, if the direct performance is direct and indirect uh, two, right? Like Sean Bieber or something like that. Yes. I'm just wondering if there's anything about the existing experimental design you think that could be changed that has the potential to reveal a difference that was not revealed in the I don't think so because I think we now say theoretically probably we already include all the effects of these two systems. Then we get in the maximum performance. I don't think you can change it to yeah. But but your estimation is only based on specific cases, right? Yes. So if you 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 didn't actually prove the yes no yeah for this for this cumulative yeah that's right that's right. <laughs> yeah. But we still expect it quite similar across different TNC as we showed before. Yeah, so the show is a full screen of the TV, and they, they did it to the performance, but they did the rating of our TV. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I have uh, one more question. So, in your, uh, uh, for the dynamic patch application, so the PML reconstruction also may affect uh, the estimation of plug input function and uh, are you going to consider that uh, yes. into the So that's system? why we use the frame by frame OSEM reconstruction to estimate the plug input function. Okay. You don't use this, you don't use the indirect tool reconstruction which is a penalty design for detection to estimate the plug input function. Thank you everyone for coming. So if you have coffee and a cookie, then feel free to take some.